Hello, and welcome back to our <laughs> tour de force of uh, post-war um, Europe. Uh, we've just very quickly covered Russia and Germany and Italy. And uh, when we last left our superheroes kind of thing. Um, in Russia, uh, Bolsheviks still in power, isolated. Germany, right wing, pissed off at the Versailles settlement. Uh, Ludendorff and Hitler using that, among others, right wingers, to kind of exploit the Versailles settlement for their own ends. In Italy, Mussolini comes to power, establishes his corporate state, and gets the Vatican's endorsement. In France, things happen a, a little bit differently. Um, there was a conservative revival in in France. There's a, one, one of my favorite books about World War One, which I would never assign because it's about 900 pages long. It's by a historian named Arno Meyer, um, and it's called Politics and Diplomacy of Peacemaking, Containment, and Counter-Revolution at Versailles. Typical academic title, really boring, but it's, I think it's a brilliant book. And in it, he says, um, during the war, the forces of movement uh, had the initiative. By forces of movement, and I'll actually use this, this paradigm again, so I'll write it out. The forces of movement were the left. And during the war, there was this kind of leftist initiative where the unions were getting stronger and the socialists, they were basically able to say, this war is bad, this is a war for the wealthy, this is a rich man's war, kind of the Debs kind of thing. And so there was this kind of leftist momentum during the war. What happens once the war ends, though, is that the forces of order, which was the old regime, which had been in charge, kind of reestablishes their primacy. So in the aftermath of the war, by 1919, 1920, 1921, and what I just talked about in both Germany and Italy is an example of this, the forces of order are basically reestablishing control. There was this brief period, three or four years, where things were dicey, and the unions were gaining more strength, and the socialists were becoming popular, and the communists were on the offensive, especially after the Bolshevik Revolution. But by 1919, 1920, 1921, things are settled in. And the old regime is very persistent. Meyer has another book called The Persistence of the Old Regime. And this is really, I think, a really simple but brilliant analytical tool that you can apply to pretty much any war. Where, you know, you'll see that after World War II, where there's this brief flurry of movement where the left gains its initiative, but then the old regime comes back in and reestablishes things. They do it differently. They have to recast society to adapt to new realities. But for the most part, it's the same people. And so you see that in, you know, clearly Mussolini's emergence, the way he crushes the socialist as part of that. Hitler and Ludendorff, the way they're able to use Versailles settlement to crush the left as part of that. In France you see it, although it certainly happens uh, uh, far less uh, uh, malignantly than it does in, in Germany or Italy. But the conservatives come back into power basically via election. Um, in the early 20s, the prime minister of France is a man named Ramon Poincar, who is anti-German and wants to take this hard line against Germany. In fact, Poincaré considers Clemenceau soft on Germany. Clemenceau was the, the prime minister at Versailles, who actually was responsible for the, the German reparations. And it's Ramon Poincaré who invades the Ruhr Valley in 1923. However, that doesn't help France's economy because what does Germany do? Passive resistance. So France is not getting anything from Germany. The idea behind Versailles was that Germany would, would pay France. It would pay them either in gold, in money, or in kind, coal and iron and things like that. None of that's happening. So as a result, in France, though not to the extreme, that Germany had, you start to see soaring inflation. In 1914, a dollar was worth five francs. By 1923, a dollar was worth 16 francs. By 1925, a dollar's worth 18.5 francs. By 1926, a dollar's worth 26.5 francs. So there's, there's you know, very significant inflation, obviously nothing uh, approaching what, what Germany um, went through. What this does, and again, I'm making a long story short and cutting a lot of steps out of the way, is ultimately it will make France reluctant to become engaged internationally again. The legacy of World War I in France is going to be, this was a mistake, it led to uh, all kinds of political problems and especially economic problems. So when this comes up again, we're going to try to avoid it. Okay? Hence, what will the policy be that France follows in the 30s be called? 
isolationism, but it's, it's actually a form of that, but it's called some appeasement. It's the same as isolationism, okay? So this is what France does. This economic shock uh, actually leads France kind of in a sense leftward because the aftermath of the war is considered really negatively. Okay, Britain, same thing. In the elections of 1918 in Britain were called the khaki elections, khaki being the color of, of military uniforms. And the German, I'm sorry, the British elections involved a lot of German bashing, okay? So if you wanted to run for office, you bashed the Germans. Um, David Lloyd George, who was the prime minister, said that Britain um, should exact the last penny we can get out of Germany up to the limit of her capacity. So again, the old regime in Britain reestablishing itself. Now, Britain had established a Labour Party. Uh, Britain, I believe, is the first European country to actually have a, a Labour Party, which allegedly exists today, although the way Tony Blair runs Britain, one would be hard-pressed to see that as being labor. Uh, uh, however, uh, uh, the old regime is able to kind of, you know, reestablish itself and, 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 you know, essentially take control. However, Britain too has economic troubles. Uh, Britain relies for currency, as all these major industrial powers do, on exports. And Britain sees a major drop in exports. Um, by 1921, uh, British exports to France and the United States, its two major trading partners, France and America, fell 65%. Uh, June 1921, 42% drop. British unemployment was about 25 to 30%. Think of that. A quarter to a third of the country is unemployed. So Britain finally starts to kind of waver, and they start to think, maybe the Germans have a point. Maybe Keynes had a point. In 1923, in fact, in Britain, a Labour government comes to power. It's the first Labour government led by Ramsay MacDonald. And Ramsay MacDonald essentially goes after the French, saying, this hard line against Germany is killing all of us. All right? So Britain begins to open up the whole question of reparations and loans and debts. The British are the first to kind of break this f facade of, of unity and say we have to re revisit this whole thing because it's messing up all of us. Now the United States officially says we're not going to negotiate, we're not going to do anything, but you know, anybody with a realistic view of the situation knows that Europe is in, in, in deep trouble. You know, with massive inflation and unemployment, uh, production is down, and Germany's just sitting on, basically sitting on its ass. They're not doing anything. Passive resistance. They are not producing goods to pay the reparations payments. So the Americans, even though officially say, we're not going to change our policy, they know they have to do something. So they send a banker to uh, uh, Europe named Charles Dawes. And hence, you will get a plan for European stabilization, which will be known as the Dawes Plan. Okay, the so Dawes Plan is right underneath corporate state. You can you can read that. So what happens? Okay, Dawes goes to Europe, 1924. Charles Dawes is a banker. He had been Secretary of State or Treasury. I can't remember at one point. He was from Marietta, Ohio. So Ohio boy, yeah. He gets there and Germany had established, uh, Germany had begun to take some measures, remember from the horrible crisis. They had abandoned passive resistance, remember they were just sitting around, they start working again. Germany goes back to work. They established a new currency, the Renten Mark, which was a trillion old marks. Why do you create a new currency? What's the point of that? Um, control, Con inflation. control inflation, right. Germany's central bank says we're going to be responsible. They go to Britain and they get loans from the Bank of Britain, from the Central Bank. They stop printing their own new money and they stop loaning money to the government. So they are now pursuing a tight money policy and the German economy begins to recover very slowly and very minimally. The key, however, to overall German recovery is what? the reparations. In their case, the debt is a form of reparations. So if you have to pay it, it's kind of the same thing, but let's, let's for the sake of, you know, kind of clarity, like, the, you know, we're going to refer to Germany as the reparations and, and the rest is the debt. All right. The key to Germany's economic revival is reparations. If reparations payments have to continue, so will German inflation because the only way they will be able to do this is to run the printing presses. So Charles Dawes comes to Europe and this is what he sees and he steps in and he establishes the Dawes plan. The Dawes plan says we will fix Germany's reparations payments for five years and as their economy increases then we will increase 
the reparations payment. So it gives Germany a little bit of a break. More importantly, it says we will assist the Germans. We will improve their economy by giving them loans of about $200 million. These will be, in the United States, people will be able to buy Dawes plan subscriptions. You can buy these loans that you will give then. I mean, Dawes raises the money through private sources. $200 million, okay? Um, the the, the uh, exchange rate, I looked it up before I came here. There's a really cool website, by the way, I sent you if you, if you want to know like what money is worth at a particular time. The exchange rate in 1920 and today is about nine dollars and 16 cents for a dollar so if I say 200 million dollars then 200 million times nine is 1.8 billion right so this is the kind of money we're talking about American uh, 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 officials want to support the Germans but they also want to make sure Germany pays to the limits of its capacity so in a sense, even though the U.S. kind of recognizes the problem and is taking some measures, it still doesn't quite get it. I mean, forcing Germany to pay to the limits of its capacity still are, 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 is going to constrict the, uh, the, the German economy. In addition to that, Germany's loans have to be paid off with interest. And how does a country gain currency or interest? What do they have to do? What's the key to, to getting getting currency, to getting outside currency, hard currency, export, trade, right, trade, trade. All right. However, that's hard to do uh, 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 because even at one point, Germany actually does begin to trade more and get export earnings. But as soon as that happens, what do the workers do? What do they want? They want higher wages, right? Because you're bringing more money in. What does the kind of, you know, what, what does the government want to do with that money? What kind of social services does it provide? I mean, all these questions are, are raised up. So the Dawes plan actually does bring a temporary economic revival, but it doesn't last long. Okay, and we'll see why. For one, one thing is that what monies that Germany does bring in are basically offset by the need to meet, you know, social needs and higher wages and so forth, okay? On another hand, and, and let me kind of give you a sneak preview of this, what we're going to see happening is, um, okay, the United States is sending money here, right, via the Dawes plan. Germany is going to use that for its reparations payments, okay? And remember that Britain and France have debts to the U.S. That makes perfect sense, that here. Yeah. It's kind of, there we go. That, that's much better now. All right, keep that in mind. We'll get, we'll get back to that. But you can kind of see where this is headed. Okay. Um, politically, uh, um, try to go through this, this, this quickly. Politically, uh, Germany is still divided. You have this kind of left socialist, independent socialists, kind of hardcore socialists, uh, uh, who are not unified uh, in some areas, however, quite strong. And then you have this kind of incipient fascist right with people like Ludendorff and Hitler. Um, all agree, however, that Germany should regain its place as a powerful nation. Germany was not allowed in the League of Nations, all right? So in 1925, the leader of Germany, a man named Gustav Stresemann, goes to France and he says, let's settle this. Let's, let's try to, to resolve all these outstanding issues of Versailles. Um, the British are enthusiastic. So in 1925, the countries of Europe get together at Locarno and they sign the Locarno treaties. In these, and, and again, you don't have to go into great detail, but what's important is that Germany is reintegrating itself into Europe. In these Locarno treaties, the major powers, the British, the Germans, the French, Italy, Belgium, sign a treaty, and um, in it, Germany says, we will give back these lands to France that we took in 1871, and the Rhineland would be demilitarized, right? Um, in addition to that, Germany agrees that it will support any victim of an unprovoked attack. All right. Um, now, these are all going to come into play later when Hitler kind of uh, rearms and, and reoccupies the Rhineland. Uh, what's important uh, beyond that is that Locarno, Germany was readmitted, not readmitted, admitted into the League of Nations and given a seat on the Council of the League of Nations. Now, think of this, just eight years after World War I, Germany is back as a big power. Right. Um, 
so uh, uh, with these agreements, Germany is reestablished as a power. Um, the French were satisfied with this as well because they got assurances from Britain that if Germany attacked, they would help them. So politically, it looks like Europe is kind of reintegrating. However, um, in a lot of these European countries, there was this real sense that their governments had sold out to the Germans. So this is kind of Alaska, and, and I, I've gone through it really quickly, and it sounds kind of disjointed. One of the important points here is that this is a last gasp effort to kind of recreate old Europe. They're trying to create these, these, these agreements. If you attack us, we'll help you. Uh, to bring Germany back in as a power on the League of Nations with a seat in the Security Council. This is kind of a last gasp attempt to recreate the old system that had uh, uh, governed prior to, uh, to the Great War. Okay? That ain't going to happen. And it's another kind of, you know, you know, nail in the coffin of the old regime. And, you know, when World War II comes, we're going to see that kind of totally upended. So economically, things like the Dawes Plan make a small attempt to, to bring stability, but don't work. Politically, they're trying to recreate the old kind of system, and that doesn't work either. So by the time the late 20s rolls around, Europe remains in a, in a fairly sticky situation. Right? And it's going to lead to an economic crisis and ultimately a, uh, the, the major economic uh, crash of 1929 and 30. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, Woodrow Wilson uh, and then Harding and Coolidge, as I said, all refused to link reparations and, and debts. Uh, they said, you owe us this money, and you're going to pay it to us, and we don't care where you get it from, basically. And this would be U.S. policy from Wilson all the way to uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. In February of 1922, the U.S. Congress established a war debt funding commission and said all war debts had to be paid within 25 years. And the only way debts would be canceled would be by payment. No linkage. Keynes was talking about that. Um, Britain in 1922 suggested writing off its share of reparations against the debts. Basically, Britain says, I'll tell you what, we owe you X amount. If you cancel that, we'll cancel Germany's reparations. It's a way, and this is very Keynesian, to create kind of inter-European uh, economic activity. And Wilson, I'm sorry, Warren G. Harding was infuriated, said, no, absolutely not. We're not going to link that. Um, so in 1923, Britain agreed to pay off a $4.5 billion war debt over 62 years with an average of 3.3% percentage a year. Uh, Italy, for instance, got 0.4%, and uh, the British ambassador was furious to 3.3% interest. He thought it would be about 2%. So basically, the U.S. is saying to Britain, you owe us this money. We want it. 62 years, 4.4%. Okay? 4.4%. That'd be nice now, but, you know, at the it's a significant, a significant amount. Now, the French don't want to negotiate. They're, they're hardcore. They believe that debts and reparations have to be linked, that reparations have to be decreased, and that debts have to be canceled. This is what Keynes suggested as well, not out of any sense of goodwill or moral propriety, simply because that is the only way you're going to encourage increased economic activity. France was also upset because it believed it was overcharged. France's debt was $3.4 billion. 1.9 of it, 1.9 billion was borrowed during the war. In addition to that, those loans were not just handouts. Those loans were given with strings attached. France, when it received those loans, had to purchase equipment from the United States. And in fact, in 1919, after the war had ended, the U.S. made France buy nearly a billion dollars of military equipment. So, yeah, we'll give you the money, but then you have to spend it here. What's the point of that? Guarantees markets. It's welfare, right? We'll give you this money, but then, you know, you have to come back and spend it. So it's a way to subsidize your own industries without handing the money straight to them. So you give it to the French or the British, and then they have to purchase things back. That's the same way the Marshall Plan works. You mentioned that when we get to that. Marshall Plan is the exact same thing. You have to buy goods from us if we give you this money, all right? Um, so both the British and the French are, are upset at, 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 about this, and they're negotiating, but there are great um, uh, arguments about the, uh, um, the interest clause. Uh, finally, in, in 1926, the Americans and the French cut a deal, 62 years, 
uh, payment at 1.6%, which is half of what Britain got. Uh, the French are upset. Uh, uh, so Europe, as you can see, has not resolved any of these economic issues. Now, one of the real problems was that, and this is where we get into dicey Econ 101 stuff, and I'll try to simplify it, and don't worry if, it, if, if it's not you know, apparent. Um, Britain, immediately after World War I ended, returned to the gold standard. Okay? Now, remember when we talked about this, the gold standard is very conservative. It means that the value of your currency has to be linked to the amount of gold in circulation. Now, the gold standard prior to World War I was $4.86. Okay? Uh, the, the dollar parity was four eighty six. What that means is that if you have gold, you can trade it, and they have to give you either one, uh, one pound or $4.86 for it. It's fixed. Okay? An ounce of gold or whatever is worth how much. So uh, uh, Keynes... Uh, said uh, that returning to the gold standard would be a mess. Okay, Keynes said if you do that, you either uh, you're not going to inflate the currency, right? You return to gold. That's very conservative. Okay, if you return to gold, the amount of currency in circulation has to be in parity to the amount of gold in circulation. Okay, so that's going to lead to deflation, if anything. Keynes said that if you have a deflationary situation, what's the result of that to people? If there's deflation, how's that going to affect average people, workers? What will that do? And what else will happen? They'll lose their jobs. Okay? It will lead to unemployment. Keynes basically said you should never create uh, economic recovery by inducing unemployment. Now, this was essentially policy until the 1980s and 90s. Reagan and Thatcher break with this, the so-called monetarism. I mean, Thatcher and Reagan both, if you recall, the economic, their so-called economic revolves of the 80s induced very high inflation. I, I'm sorry, unemployment, 8, 10, 12 percent in many cases. So uh, uh, Keynes said, uh, it is worse in an impoverished world to provoke unemployment than to disappoint a rentier. A rentier is basically somebody who lives off the income of, of property. Okay, so uh, uh, Keynes, um, Keynes' suggestion was that Britain not return to the gold standard, that they let the currencies float, which may cause inflation. But inflation, as we said before, if you're in debt, inflation isn't so bad, right? Because your debts are going back and you're being paid at, at, at cheaper, you know, with cheaper money. And in addition to that, with inflation, your wages will probably uh, uh, go up uh, uh, as well. Okay, Keynes loses out uh, on this one. Um, so uh, uh, um, the return to the gold standard and conservative money policy, now how do you think that will affect trade? It's the other kind of part of this. One is unemployment and wages. Trade is the other aspect of this. A return to gold, a return to conservative monetary policy. Yeah. Any, any econ majors in here? What do you think? Uh, in general, the decrease in the, it, the of trade. Yeah, and it does. That, that's, that was Keynes' warning. He said, this is going to decrease trade. Because, again, you know, you have to trade based on this gold standard at fixed rates. So if you, you know, if, if the rates can't be devalued or if they can't be adjusted, then a pound is worth $4.86. That's it, you know. <coughs> and, you know, if it's fixed, then... Essentially, if one country has inflation, you're going to export that inflation because your prices are going to be inordinately high, and that country can't adapt. That country can't change its currencies to adapt to your inflation because it's fixed, according to this gold standard. Keynes saw that coming, all right? So uh, uh, Keynes said, you know, again, we can do that. You know, we can maintain this $4.86 uh, uh, conversion rate based on the gold standard. But if we do it, we will intensify, intensify unemployment. And uh, uh, the workers will get lower wages and they will lose their jobs. Uh, 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 Keynes concludes in his own in economic speak, the proper object of dear money, you know, valuable money, conservative money, the proper object of dear money is to check an incipient boom. Woe to those who use it to aggravate a depression, which is basically what happens in... Uh, in, uh, in Europe. So by the late 20s then, uh, trade is seriously reduced. I have a, a map here I'll show you in a minute. 
So by 1929 then, uh, uh, Britain has no economic revival, unemployment is high, and inflation in Germany and France is still high. So just as the U.S. had sent Charles Dawes to Europe in 1929, they sent the president of General Electric, Owen Young, to Europe. And the Young plan again adjusted um, the reparations payments. Uh, they lowered Germany's total obligation to $8 billion over 58 years at 5.5% interest, okay? Um, this is an aspect of what you know, Taft would call dollar diplomacy. Okay? The U.S. is going to use economic measures to try to get its way rather than, than coercive. Um, the Dawes and Young plans were popular among Americans. I mean, a lot of Americans subscribed in these. It was easy to come up with the money. People wanted to invest in Germany. Why wouldn't they? I mean, Germany may be you know, really in deep difficulty right now, but this was an economic power, so it's considered a fairly safe investment, and there aren't that many places in the world to invest. So uh, between 1924 and 31, Americans invested over $2.5 billion in Germany, and, and Germany was doing pretty well, okay? Uh, however, uh, 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 those kinds of investment, as, as any capital would, these, this isn't money, this is capital, right? These are capital investments. Capital depends on a continuing outflow, okay? And a continued use of that money for productive means. Well, that isn't really happening. Basically, what you get with, with some, all right, well, the way it should work, if we can go to this, is that the United States gives money to Germany, whether it be the Dawes or the Young plants, right? Right. Now, ideally, what would Germany do with that money? Hmm? Support industry, build up industry, right? And then, what would they be able to do then as a result of that, that industry? What would they do with the, they would be able to export it, and then what would they get for those exports? More money, and then what would they do with some of that money? Pay back the reparations, okay? Britain and France, what, what's, their, what's their role here? What would they do? They would get reparations payments from Germany, right? And then what would they do, ideally? No, ideally, what would they do? Invest it in their own industries, make goods, sell stuff, get provinces and some of that back, okay? That's not the way it works out. Basically, what you have is an economic cycle instead where the Dawes and Young money goes to Germany. Germany does use a little of it and has a brief economic revival. But the British and French are intransigent. They won't reduce the debts payments, why? because America won't reduce the, I'm sorry, they won't reduce the reparations payments. Why? Because America won't reduce the debts payments. So the money goes to Germany. Germany, for the most part, sends it to Britain and France. And Britain and France, what do they do with it? They send it back to the United States. Okay, this money should be stopping and used for economic activity, but it's not. It's just going around. Okay, it's not productive money. It's basically sterile money. It's basically surplus capital. Now, the real problem there, and Keynes said, reparations and debts are mostly settled on paper and not in goods. The United States lends money to Germany. Germany transfers its equivalent to the Allies, and the Allies pass it back to the United States government. Nothing real passes. No one is penny worse. This is the problem you have. It's not being used to reinvigorate the economy yet what the terms were for those loans that were granted under the Dawes plan? The Dawes... Or uh, uh, what's that? The No, I can find it easily enough. Yeah, it's, it's probably in any basic textbook. I'm always a, a, you know, kind of in a quandary as to how much, I think I'm going into probably too much detail right now and I could kind of really go off on this. Uh, um, I'm, I'm kind of a weirdo, but this stuff really kind of interests and excites me. I think this is really kind of the guts of the way, this, this, this is globalization, you know, this is, this is really globalization. The point here is that Keynes wants to create a, a, a free trade area of Europe and, and the way to do that is not to continue to send this money around and to be intransigent on the reparations debts payments. You know, this is liberal economics, economics, okay? Keynes is the, the prototype liberal of the 20th century. 
And, and it's really ironic because, you know, Keynesianism ruled the roost until the late 70s, early 80s. And really Reagan and Thatcher are the kind of renunciation of Keynesianism. And it's funny, you know, that nowadays we see all this kind of attacks on, you know, left-wing Keynesians. You know, left-wing Keynesians made global globalization possible. They made this kind of incredible global wealth possible. That's the idea. You know, liberalism means these free and open markets and to have this kind of economic activity and interchange. And so the attack on him, you know, never really kind of... Uh, 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 made sense uh, uh, to me. Um, so by 1929, then you have this kind of this, this kind of circulation of money, but nothing is really being uh, produced by it. As a result of that, um, if nothing is being produced, all right, and you have excess capital, that becomes surplus capital. And what is surplus capital? We've talked about that before. It's money that's not being put into productive capacity, right? As a result of that, what's going to happen to production? If you have excess money and you're not using it for production, you're, wh why would you produce more? Nothing's being traded, right? So on one hand, you're going to have even more production, all right? but it's not going to be sold. So the output of capital goods rises between 1927 and 29. But without a commensurate increase in trade, what happens? I will show you in a minute. OK. Is that coming across? Yeah, All right. this is a, a spider web. This is trade in, in uh, where are we here? January of 1929, okay? Uh, this is the imports in millions of dollars. So this is, uh, what do you do? Add six zeros to that. So that's two, what is it, trillion dollars? Three, tr almost three trillion, right? Okay, that's in 1929. By 1933, it's 992. All right, so this is a, a three to one drop. It's, that's billion, I'm sorry. But this is a three to one decrease. That's, that's what's important to know. All right, so the, 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 these are the, the starting, starting and ending numbers. You start at, at, at 3,000 and you end at 992. So trade is 30% in 1933 of what it had been in 1929. Now, extrapolate that. What does that mean if trade is down? What, if, what, what consequences is that going to have? Unemployment. Unemployment in the United States alone went from 1.5 million in 1919 to 12 million in 1932. So this is a 600-700% uh, uh, percent um, increase. All right? Unemployment goes up. Production, it just stopped. Factories go, go, go dormant because what's the point of producing anything because you have no trade? The U.S. has no outlets anymore for its capital. The major outlet, I mean, you know, we talked about the third world and Asia and Latin America, and we'll continue to talk about that, but those countries are still underdeveloped. What is going to be and will remain the major outlet for American capital? It's got to be Europe. And within Europe, what's the most important country? Germany. Okay, so the failure for the failure of German reconstruction means that the U.S. continues to have no outlets. Okay, and hence you have a major economic crash. There are a lot of reasons behind the American crash of 1929, uh, and it's kind of hard. I mean, they're all kind of intertwined, but there's no doubt that this is a major one. This kind of this this continued um, uh, a circular motion where the U.S. gives money to Germany, Dawes and Young plans, Germany uses it to pay its reparations. The French and the British take that and use it to pay off the debts. And so the money keeps floating around and it's not being put into production. It's not being used to make stuff which could then be sold for export earnings, which could then be used to pay off debts or to build more stuff. So production drops dramatically. And with this increase in, uh, in debt, with this lack of, of production, you see this amazing contraction of world trade where you go uh, to, uh, in just three, four years, uh, a trade declines by more than two thirds or Know, whatever you do the math there all right uh, a lot of detail but I think it's important stuff anybody have any questions on this no you understand it perfectly right you're just amazed at, at how uh, anyway, I lost my thing there you're just amazed at how, how lucid and clear that was right all right no questions Okay, we get to shift from Europe to Asia. Continue our virtual geographic mission here. All right. 
No, I do have a map there. Cool. All right. Um, just as the economic reintegration of Europe is critical uh, to uh, U.S. economic health after World War I, <clears throat> the United States continues to believe that the markets of Asia are essential for long-term economic prosperity. And we saw this with Hayes Open Door Notes and you know, Hawaii and the Philippines in 1898 and, and the uh, uh, Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, dollar diplomacy, the Lansing Ishii Agreement. The U.S. has trying to establish itself as a Pacific power for some time. In the 20s, the U.S. actually gets involved in a naval arms race. Okay. Uh, the key to a big navy would be to have a navy that can operate in the Pacific. And actually the U.S., Britain, and Japan actually even come to agreements on uh, uh, the amount of ships that they should be allowed to have. Uh, so throughout the 20s then, um, the U.S. is trying to limit the amount of naval uh, build, the, the, the naval buildup. Now the goal of the U.S. isn't to be a military power in Asia, it's to be what? an economic power in Asia to use dollars instead of bullets. So the way the Americans think about it, if we can limit the naval buildup in this in this in the, in the ocean between the US and Japan and, and Britain, which is still a, a uh, an Asian power, then we can use our strength, which is our, our 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 money, our capital to get a foothold and especially to get into China. All right? Um, China uh, I want to kind of briefly go over that. China is continues to be in some le to some level of disarray. Remember when we talked about the Boxer Rebellion and and the Chinese Revolution and 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 all of that. Um, in China, uh, uh, in 1914, you finally had kind of a, a, the establishment of a stable government. Um, led by Sun Yat-sen. This is referred to as the Chinese Republic. This is kind of the official end of the, uh, the Manchu uh, uh, dynasty. Now, Sun Yat-sen uh, is, is kind of unites all of China. In fact, he was close with both uh, uh, Zhou Enlai. Anybody ever heard of Zhou Enlai? He was the communist foreign minister after the revolution. And a man named Zheng Zhexi, who at the time was known as Chiang Kai-shek. Sun Yat-sen establishes something called the Kuomintang, now known as the Kuomintang. It's the Chinese Nationalist Repu uh, uh, Party, the political party. All right. Now, Sun Yat-sen basically unifies China and is trying to establish China as an independent country. Sun Yat-sen doesn't like the fact that the British and the Russians and the Germans and especially the Japanese are coming in and trying to gain control of China and carve it up. He believes that China ought to be a major global power, and he's trying to rebuild it along those lines. All right? Sun Yat-sen dies, however, very young. He dies in 1925, and his brother-in-law, Zhang Zhexi, or Chiang Kai-shek, takes over. Now, at the time, the two major parties were the Kuomintang and the CCP. Does anybody know what that stands for? Chinese Communist Party. Okay, these are the two major groups, the two major political groups in China. All right? Now, they united against two factions, the warlords, the kind of old regime, and the Japanese. Because Japan, remember, continues to want, remember it continues to insist on this special relationship with China. Japan continues to believe that it ought to have control over, over China. So, Zhang Jirshi and the communists unite to fight the warlords and they do this successfully and they're fighting against Japan but then Zhang Jirshi turns on the communists and massacres them and this sets off the communists on their famous escape march called the Long March right so by the late 20s and early 30s China is essentially beset by civil war between the government of Zhang Jirshi, Guomindang, and Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and the Chinese Communist Party. And in the early 30s, the communists are fleeing. This is when they literally travel by foot thousands of miles to escape uh, uh, the army. All right? At the same time this is happening, at the same time the communists are fleeing, the Japanese begin to attack. All right? In 1931, in uh, uh, an area of Manchuria, the uh, Japanese military blows up a railroad, I'm sorry, a bridge, it was called the Marco Polo Bridge, and uh, in a place called Mukden, 
Now, this is kind of the opening salvo in the war in the Pacific. The United States and Japan are vying for Pacific power, especially with regard to where? China. China. Got it. All right. So the Japanese attack in Mukden. Let me kind of go down a little. Where is this? All right. In this area here. I can't highlight this, but you kind of you can see where that is. Manchuria, and this is and there's Mukden right there. Can you see that? All right, and we'll go back to this. But we're talking about this is the area in northern China, Manchuria. It's really resource rich. Okay, what does the U.S. do when the Japanese attack Manchuria? We talked about the League of Nations. Okay, the U.S. is not in the League of Nations. The League of Nations sends a commission to investigate Japanese actions in Manchuria. And they basically say, well, Japan's guilty. They, they did something wrong. That's it. That's all they do. The U.S. Secretary of State is a man named Henry Stimson. And he said, we will not recognize any gains that Japan makes. He believes in moral persuasion moral persuasion. So the U.S. is essentially pretty much impotent. In 1932 then, it marches into Manchuria and establishes its own government, a puppet state called Manchukuo. There we go, Manchukuo down there. All right. That area, Manchuria, that I saw, that I showed you in the, in the previous map, uh, uh, Japan goes in and takes over that entire area and establishes its own government. They call it Manchuria. Has anyone ever seen the, the uh, Bertolucci movie, The Last Emperor? That's what this is about, all right? Uh, the last emperor, the last <coughs> Qing emperor was, a, was a, at the time a, a, a young boy named Henry Puyi. And Henry Puyi, by this time, is I don't know, he's in his late 20s, early 30s. He's still fairly young. And the, the, the Japanese take Henry Puyi and they reinstall him as a piece of puppet, right? He's, I mean, the, the Japanese are actually calling the shots. They're running Manchuria. Uh, and they rename it Manchukuo. Uh, and they put Henry Puyi in power. So the, the uh, uh, a Japanese, this is before Hitler or Mussolini have done anything like in Ethiopia or Austria or anywhere. The Japanese have gone into Manchuria, which is a vital area. Everybody wants that for minerals, for resources, for, for railway. And the Japanese have taken it over. And the U.S. doesn't do anything. The U.S. basically uh, 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 sits back and really is unable other than to condemn Japan uh, 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 to do anything. It simply issues this policy of non-recognition. Now, inside of China, now, the Chinese presumably should be fighting against who? The Japanese. However, who is the Guomindang fighting against? The communists. And in fact, if anybody fights against, if anybody's fighting against Japan, it's, it's the CCP. Okay? So, uh, 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 Jiang Jirshi is far more interested in keeping the communists subdued than in fighting against Japan. And Jiang Jirshi, however, is a favorite of the United States. He uh, had converted to Methodism. Uh, his wife uh, came from a very famous and wealthy Chinese family, the Sung family. Uh, his wife just died last year. She was 106 years old. She was living in Princeton, uh, Madam Chang. Uh, so, uh, uh, for her what? Like a lot of them, or what? That's Marco, uh, Imelda Marcos. There's this kind of stereotype of Asian women, the dragon lady stereotype, and Imelda Marcos and Madam Chang and Madam New. I mean, that's often used against Asian, like kind of powerful Asian women, but that's all often part of the kind of kind of the whole image image on them, right? But uh, uh, and Zhang Jirshi especially had real good contacts with American businessmen. And especially Henry Luce, who headed um, Time Magazine and Life Magazine and all this stuff. So, which meant Zhang Jirshi got two things. Great publicity in the United States and a lot of foreign aid. Tons of foreign aid. And in fact, in 1937, Time Magazine picked Zhang Jirshi and his wife, Madam Zhang, as the man and wife of the year. They said that the Chinese people, under one supreme ruler and his remarkable wife, were fighting for Western civilization. <laughs> Think about that. 
for a minute. <laughs> They're fighting for a Western civilization. American missionaries called Chiang Kai-shek the most enlightened, patriotic, and able ruler in the 3,000 year history of China because who would know more about 3,000 years of Chinese history than white American missionaries, right? Um, you're kind of jumping ahead, but one of my favorite quotes, it comes from World War II when the U.S. is talking about developing China and a senator from Nebraska stands up and he says, we will lift Shanghai up and up, ever up, until it is just like Kansas City. <laughs> all right. Why is Jiang Jiaxi getting all this great PR? Because Japan invades China. Japan wasn't happy with Manchukuo. It decides it wants the whole island, the whole country. So in 1937, Japan goes in and invades all of China. And it's a brutal invasion, far worse than anything that the Nazis did prior to Poland. Uh, you know, even after Poland and France, actually, it's, but it, it, as brutal as anything you would see until the invasion of, of the Soviet Union in 41. Uh, the famous rape of Nanking, a Ch Japanese aviators fly missions and they just destroy uh, 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 Chinese villages. And what does the U.S. do once more? Non-recognition, moral persuasion. Okay. Uh, in China, Zhang Jiaxi and Mao Zedong actually established a united front, but truth be told, Zhang continued to fight against the communists, whereas the communists were fighting against the Japanese. What is the U.S. policy on this besides moral persuasion? What does it do with regard to trade? It continues to trade with Japan at ten times the level it does with China. So even though Japan is committing these atrocities in China, U.S. trade with Japan continues at the same levels that it had before. Japanese, Japan's goal was to establish, I think I've, I've said this before, the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. This, and I'll show you the map again in a minute, basically Japan's idea is that as an Asian power, as the only really modern Asian power, Japan is industrialized, it's, it's modern, it's, it's called westernized, it's called civilized, but they are a modern industrial power. And the Japanese believe that as the only modern industrial power in Asia, in the Pacific, they should be in control of a regional agreement, kind of a regional condominium in which all of the countries in Asia would work together with Japan, kind of of gaining the benefits of that. They would have, you know, kind of a, a, a kind of the, the model would be today would be something like the, 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 the European market or NAFTA or something like that. Not a, not a terribly good example, but you kind of get the idea where they believe in these regional arrangements where as the most powerful, as the most advanced, as the most economically profitable country, they would have a, a certain interest in all of these places. But these places would benefit from their association with Japan as well. They would have guaranteed markets, they would have places to sell their stuff, they would, be in, they would have Japanese investment capital and so forth. So it would be a co-prosperity sphere, right? Everybody would benefit, right? Co-prosperity. So this is, uh, this is Japan's uh, uh, goal, all right, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, late 30s. And as part of that, uh, remember they, they had taken over Korea and was it 1914 or something like that, uh, uh, take over Manchukuo in 31, 32, invade China in 1937. Uh, uh, once the war commences, they will go into Indochina and the Japanese will take over Vietnam and then also Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies. So this is all part of their goal of creating a greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. The Philippines, Hawaii, everything, all of Asia, all of the Pacific will be Japanese, you know, kind of control, Japanese influenced, all right? So this is the goal. Now, what does the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere mean for Americans? What's, what's the problem? No free trade, right? It is a closed system. That is a closed door. Okay, so the fact, I mean, you know, everybody's appalled and the media makes much out of these atrocities and the rape of Nanking and so forth. But the real problem there is that this is closed. The China market, 500,000 people by this time, right? You know, uh, uh, just think if we could sell everybody in China one Coca-Cola a day. I mean, that's really, you know, that's the way people used to think. There was a famous uh, uh, book or movie uh, uh, in the 20s called 400 million or 300 million oil lamps. Basically, the idea was a book. It was the, the, basically, the idea there was, you know, know, if we could sell everybody in China an oil lamp, you know what Rockefeller used to do was go there and he'd hand out oil lamps for free. He'd give everybody an oil lamp. What's the point of that? Why do that? Then they have to buy oil. Where are they going to buy it from? It's the same thing when, when China started pirating um, windows in the mid-90s. Initially, Bill Gates was angry, but then he thought, why not? And so, you know, they continue that. So what 
Windows, Microsoft is their operating system, right? So it's kind of a way, you know, it's kind of a loss leader. You know, you go in and you throw some freebies out, you know, and uh, it's kind of like a traveling salesman who gives you a few, you know, free this or free that or something like that, and then pretty soon you're hooked, okay? So uh, this is still the dream. Now the Greater East Asian Core Prosperity Fair shuts that off. It closes down those markets. It closes down those resources. It closes down that labor. All right. This is the problem. And when we get to Europe, we'll see that you know Hitler is the same threat. It's not necessarily this moral argument because that's really not the issue. I mean, if it was, the U.S. would have acted far sooner than it did. You know, Hitler was 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 you know taking you know uh, when did Kristallnacht occur? Thirty three or thirty two or something like that against the Jews, and yet the U.S. maintained quotas on Jews emigrating into the U.S. well into what the late thirties, early forties, right? So this isn't a moral issue, it, it, you know, and it can become one later. This is about closing the door, and the real threat that the Japanese. Uh, uh, Greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere poses is that it will close off this incredibly vital potential market to the United States and nobody wants that. So the, the U.S. has to do something. Now it doesn't have the capacity in the 30s and we'll talk about that in a minute. The U.S. is in an isolationist period and in fact there are laws on the book keeping it neutral. There's this great sense of, of a, a public outcry against the U.S. getting involved in another war. The aftermath of World War I, as I said, had been very disillusioning. People had a bad taste in their mouths about World War I. In addition to that, uh, uh, there were these hearings uh, led by a senator named Gerald Nye, which suggested that World War I was caused by war profiteering, that all these companies got into the war so they could make money off of it. So Americans didn't want any part of the war. So Roosevelt doesn't do anything, and he really he has these neutral neutrality laws so he's not, not able to do anything even if he wanted to, and that's debatable. So Roosevelt calls for a quarantine of Japan. But, but that's it. It's, it's, again, it's all rhetoric. There's no sanctions. There's no economic blockade. There are no boycotts. There's no military threat. It's a, you know, we need to quarantine them. Like, you know, you separate them, isolate them. But, but there's nothing beyond that. In 1937, a group of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Japanese aviators, Japanese warplanes, uh, 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 actually sunk an American warship uh, as they began to attack uh, Nanking. And uh, Roosevelt and his Secretary of State, Cordell Hall, were furious at the Japanese. For, for attacking their ship. Uh, Japan apologized, but Roosevelt wasn't sure. J Roosevelt didn't believe it was a mistake. The Japanese said, you know, we're sorry, that was a mistake. Roosevelt believed that it was uh, intentional. And in fact, he actually considered at that point oil embargoes and freezing Japanese assets. All right, and, and I'm going to go through this again really quickly. These are kind of the two major points. If you want to hurt Japan, and you see this happen all the time, the US did this with Iran, with Iraq, everybody else. If you want to hurt a country, you freeze their assets, which means that, what's that mean? If you freeze a country's assets, they can't get to the money they have in your, in your country, right? So you, that they can get a, have access to their securities, their bonds, whatever. Okay, and the key one is this is an oil embargo, right? Now, what kind of domestic oil industry, this is a trick question, right? What kind of domestic oil industry does Japan have? How big is Japan's domestic oil industry? They have not. Japan has no n indigenous sources of oil. So where does it get most of its oil from? Hmm? Not yet. Not in the 30s. Today, yeah. United States. Yeah, United States, right. And some in Latin America. And it increased its purchases from Latin America in the 30s, from Mexico in particular and some in Venezuela. But it's the U.S., right? So if the U.S. really wants to put a, a major damper on Japanese aggression, what, what, is, the, what is the one kind of killer? It's, it's an oil embargo. And a lot of people are telling, uh, telling FDR, embargo oil, embargo oil. You want to hurt him, embargo oil. FDR doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to precipitate a crisis with Japan. Okay, <coughs> so he continues to back off. <coughs> this is in 1937. You don't get an oil embargo and a freezing of assets until 1941. So for four years, the U.S. essentially sits there and hams and haws and negotiates, but nothing really happens until 1941, when, as in Europe with Germany, the U.S. finally sees that Japan is, is not stopping. They're going to continue uh, to, to uh, proceed on this aggressive path. So uh, Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's the president now, clearly wants to avoid war with Japan, uh, continues, wants to continue trade, wants to continue to kind of some kind of a, the term often used as modus vivendi, you know, way of living, accommodation, way of getting along with the Japanese. Uh, in order to uh, preserve, you know, kind of uh, access to the open door. Uh, 
doesn't work. In 1940, the Japanese go into Southeast Asia, they go into Vietnam, they go into the Dutch East Indies, they join with Italy and Germany in this uh, uh, axis. Uh, finally, in 1940, uh, Roosevelt begins to embargo first aviation fuel and scrap iron. Uh, uh, a couple of his, many of his advisors were told to embargo oil. He still uh, went slow on that, uh, hoping to avoid, I mean, an oil embargo was, would be kind of a, a signal that all had fallen apart. If you embargo oil, Japan will take that as an aggressive act, and your chances of an accommodation have, have pretty much evaporated. So Roosevelt uh, 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 doesn't do that. Yeah? Are there also kind of domestic economic implications for for domestic reasons, would Roosevelt have been? Yeah, I, th I think he was reluctant. Sure, he was reluctant to cut off a market, a big market, sure. Yeah, of course. I've read it, like 85% of Japan's oil from the U.S. But yeah. It could be substantial. Oh, it was. I, you, know, you know, I'm sure that's part of it, especially there's a depression going on, and you don't want to lose that. But I think even more than that, it's this real sense that, uh, uh, um, you know, liberal open door trade is, is not, you know, kind of facilitated by war. And, and the, real, the real goal there, I think, is to avoid war, to come to some kind of an, a, a liberal trade agreement on it. Uh, uh, and, you know, these kinds of embargoes and, and kind of punitive and, and actions, these sanctions, you know, really make, make that, you know, far more difficult. But, yeah, yeah, clearly the U.S. doesn't want to lose that market. Um, you know. Um, finally, though, in 1941, it's, it's the invasion of Indochina. That, that finally does it. Uh, in September of 1940, Roosevelt, uh, I'm sorry, Japan goes into the, the Dutch East Indies. I think I misspoke a minute earlier. They go into uh, Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies in 1940. In July of 41, uh, they go into uh, uh, Indochina. Why? What's, what's, especially Indonesia. What's in Indonesia? Dutch shell, right? So uh, at that point, Roosevelt says, OK, these guys aren't going to stop. This greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere is basically trying to shut off all of the Pacific to us. We can't allow that to happen. So finally, in the summer of 41, Roosevelt stops all trade with Japan, seizes all Japanese assets, and finally includes an oil embargo. Japan's in trouble at this point without American oil. Um, this is when the U.S. begins intercepting their messages. Japan is clearly planning something. No one is really sure what. Um, and on December 7th, the U.S. knows something's going to happen. They actually think it's going to happen at the Philippines, but instead Japan strikes Pearl Harbor. Um, Japanese ships had been headed towards Southeast Asia. The U.S. didn't think that they were capable of two major operations at once. The Southeast Asia, the, the, uh, <coughs> the fleet was actually a feint, and the real attack, obviously, was at Pearl Harbor. Um, it gave Japan a short-term advantage. Caught the U.S. off guard, and for six months, Japan was able to kind of have its way in the Pacific. But Admiral Yamamoto, the head of Japan's Navy, said, uh, I'll run wild for six months to a year, but I am utterly without confidence after that. And that's exactly what happened. But it does draw the U.S. into the war um, in 1941. Okay? Very quick. Uh, and, and, and again, the real problem there, you can see on the, the map here, which will give you some sense of how, how much. Uh, see this yellow line? All right, initially it's the. Um, wait a second, I have the. All right, and this, this kind of. Um, <laughs> my pointing my finger at it, that's smart. Uh, this, this color stuff here, like Mukden and French Indochina, that kind of, what is that, brown or yellow or whatever, orange, it's a different color on yours than on mine. That's the area that uh, Japan controls. What is it, December 7, 1941. But then within six months, see this, this yellow line, that perimeter? Japan gains control of all of that. So within, what, six, seven months, it basically has you know, that entire uh, uh, you know, Western Pacific. Okay. So that's, that's the maximum area they were at before the Guadalcanal. This is before, um, is it Guadalcanal or, or Midway? Well, August 7, 42 was Guadalcanal. Was it Guadalcanal? Okay. Where's Midway? I guess Midway's outside that. Yeah, it's close to Pearl Harbor. Yeah, there's Midway. Okay, yeah. So there. But I mean, what's really important? I mean, a lot of these are small ones. What's important well, is, uh, is uh, Philippines. I was lucky I found that on time. I would have embarrassed myself. The Philippines uh, uh, and, and China are, are kind of more developed. And, you know, this leads. I'm going to go through the war in like five minutes. So if you're interested in that, there's a lot more stuff on it. But prior to that, you can see. Um, you know, the U.S., I'm sorry, they have Mukden, they have parts of China, uh, 
Indochina, and then the Dutch East Indies aren't, aren't on there, but the, the Japanese also take control of that too. Okay. So then, you can kind of see what's happening. Um, by the late 30s, um, oops, I just did that one, dope. In Europe, um, the, the biggest problem is economic. There's, there's a global economic crisis, a, a global economic depression. Uh, so let me use this, there we go. All right. The global economic depression, and uh, this is going to, you know, have grave consequences for the United States. In Asia, um, Japan is trying to close off this open door, and especially with regard to access to uh, to uh, China. All right, so you can kind of see this build up and where this is headed. Right? Any anybody have any questions? I'm going through this pretty quickly because I do want to, you know, kind of get through as much as I can. But you know, if you have any questions, don't don't let me kind of fly through this if there's something important that I'm missing. So, no? Yeah? Control of the Pacific now is the Japanese primarily, what, strategic and refueling? Because a lot of it is, yeah. Outside of the Chinese market, I can't mention the Japanese people on the Marshall Islands. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, that's, that's more strategic. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's to, to, to have that, but also to prevent you know, the U.S. from, from establishing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. No, they have, and that's why I said, you know, the Philippines is really the only one, I think, of re only, only island of real consequence in that region that has, you know, that's more than simply a, a fueling station or, or anything like that, or, you know, a, a stopping off point, or, you know, you can fly, fly uh, aviation out of it or something like that, yeah. All right, um, I want to talk a little bit about Latin America now. And um, Latin America is different than Europe or Asia in the sense that it's not really in play, right? There's no great, um, there's no great uh, uh, conflict or, or, or contest over who will control it. I mean, everybody knows that this is part of America's uh, uh, protect, protectorate zone, Monroe Doctrine, Roosevelt Corollary. And so uh, uh, it's not in play. It's not really up for, for grabs. Uh, however, it's very important because the way the U.S. interacts with Latin America uh, could potentially cause trouble, and in fact does throughout the 20s and 30s. And it's also reflective of kind of the way that the open door works. It's kind of reflective of this global system that the U.S. is creating. Uh, so I want to talk about that. It's also, I think, important because the, the type of measures that the U.S. takes to assert control in Latin America really do belie a lot of the rhetoric about American beneficence and a lot of uh, about American exceptionalism. I mean, what you see in Latin America more than in probably any other region, in fact, in which the U.S. operates, because it's so close and because the U.S. has such an intimate relationship there, is a program use of terror as a political weapon not necessarily conducted by the U.S., although sometimes it is, but by its proxies with full consent and support of America. So we're going to start talking about that, and that'll be a theme. All right. Um, Latin America is important, and we've talked about that to some extent already, uh, especially because it's an area where there's a lot of American investment and the need for markets. Um, and the U.S. increasingly gains influence and control. In 1895, I believe, the Secretary of State, one of my favorite quotes ever, Richard Olney, uh, was talking about uh, Latin America, <clears throat> which allegedly has sovereign independent countries. But Olney said, the United States is practically sovereign on this continent, and its fiat is law upon the subjects to which it confines its interposition. That's a really ugly sentence, but what's he saying? All right? All right? The U.S. is practically sovereign on this continent, can do anything at once, and its fiat is law upon the subjects to which it confines its interposition. The U.S. word is law upon the subjects to which it confines interactions, to which it, with which it interacts. But he's calling all of Latin America American subjects. Okay? And remember Woodrow Wilson in 1907 saying, since the manufacturer insists on having the world as a market, the flag of the nation must follow him, and the doors of nations which are closed against him must be battered down. Concessions obtained by financiers must be safeguarded by ministers of state, even if the sovereignty of unwilling nations be outraged in the process. The Navy has to follow bankers and follow commercial interests and take care of things. And probably nowhere do we see that as much as in Latin America. 
okay? And through the 19 teens and 1920s, the legacy of intervention in Latin America was great. And we've talked about that in Cuba, both with the war and the Platt Amendment, in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, et cetera. In the 1920s, the, there was a famous American comedian named Will Rogers, very political, kind of a, kind of a, a Robin Williams sort of kind of character. Uh, Will Rogers said that uh, he was shocked one day because he looked outside and he actually saw a Marine on American soil. And this was a joke because the Marines were always in Central America, Latin America, you know, running the government there. So he was shocked. He actually saw one in the United States. <clears throat> but uh, by the 1930s, when Franklin Roosevelt becomes president, the U.S. has to take a different path. These interventions uh, have a cost associated with them. The more that the U.S. intervenes, the more that the U.S. has to send the Marines in, the more that American Marines are uh, attacking Latin uh, uh, American uh, uh, villagers, uh, the more that they prop up uh, brutal regimes there, the more that American businessmen come in and run those countries, then what's the offshoot of that? What is the consequence of that in those countries? The United States becomes more and more isolated. Anti-American sentiment rises. Attacks on the United States and politicians who attack the United States come to the fore. And ultimately, business is much harder. Now, that doesn't mean that the U.S., because it's so big, can't go in and do whatever it wants. But ultimately, do you want to have to go in all the time and use force? Or would it be easier maybe to kind of craft a new relationship to get business done? Because after all, what did William Howard Taft say? We will substitute what for what? Dollars. Dollars for bullets, right. Franklin Roosevelt then decides that he will pursue the policy of the good neighbor, all right. Roosevelt wants to find new tactics. Now this is a tactical shift. The goals remain pretty much the same, which is hegemony. What Roosevelt's trying to do is create a new type of hegemony, one that's not so ponderous, one that's not so burdensome, one that's not so damned ugly, you know, one that, that you know, it's uh, what does Neil Young say about Bush, you know, a kinder, gentler machine gun hand, you know? That's essentially what, what, what FDR is looking for, to do the same stuff, to have the same results, but to do it differently, to have a, a tactical shift. So in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt proclaimed, and this is a quote, the policy of the good neighbor, the neighbor who resolutely respects himself and, because he does so, respects the rights of others, the neighbor who respects his obligations and respects the sanctity of agreements in and with a world of neighbors. When Roosevelt talks about obligations and sanctity of agreements, what do you think he's talking about? Commerce, what kind especially? That's, that's. If these countries are in debt to the U.S., that means that those neighbors have to respect their obligations. That means they have to pay their debt. Okay. Roosevelt also says, off, off, off the cuff remark, they think they're as good as we are, and many of them are, so let's give them a chance. Okay. What is America's key role in Latin America? Capital investment. It's an important place for the U.S. to invest. About one-third of America's total investments abroad are in Latin America. And it's really crucial to Latin American development. What it does, however, and this is crucial, is it leads to uneven, incredibly uneven development in Latin America, okay, where it maintains this kind of, and props up this old kind of caudillo structure. U.S. capital was heavily invested throughout the region in mining, in petroleum, in fruit, in agriculture, and so forth. American investment in 1914 was $1.26 billion. By 1929, $3.52 billion. And remember, the exchange rate is somewhere in the 9 to 1 uh, uh, vicinity. In electricity, bananas, sugar, mineral oils, so forth. The United States bought copper and bonds in Chile. The U.S. controlled about 70 percent of Cuba's sugar industry. The United States, through UFCO, the United Fruit Company, controlled the Honduran economy and overthrew governments there when it suited their needs. In Venezuela, the United States had major oil interest, which occur, accounted for half of all Venezuelan revenues. In Nicaragua, the United States controlled the government and established the National Guard, the Guardia, and hunted down nationalists. We'll talk about that. In El Salvador, Salvador, the United States supported the governments against the rebel army led by Farabundo Marti. Okay, so the United States in all these regions is deeply immersed in local politics and economics. Okay, it's going to change things though. 
Change is going to come. It's not going to know. It's no. It's no longer going to always send the Marines in to kind of just have their way and do their thing. The U.S. now is going to have a good neighbor policy. So instead of sending in the Marines, it's going to engage in what some critics call colonization by contract. Okay. Instead of. Uh, um, And what, what does this sound like? Colonization by contract, what does that sound like? What have we talked about before that? Instead of sending in bullets, you send in dollars, right? In fact, the United States sent in advisors called money doctors. Okay? It would send in bankers and economics professors and economists and people like that. And what would they do? They would go there to fix Latin American economies. And how would they fix these economies? they would recommend gold exchange currency reforms, basically pegging their economies to gold, which of course would be pegged to the dollar. They would encourage them to develop central banks to manage the economy. Central banks controlled by whom? Or owned by whom? The United States. Remember, what was the issue? Why did the U.S. intervene in, in the Dominican Republic and Haiti both? Because what happened there with the central banks? Remember that? Because Germany and France had major stakes in those central banks. So. Uh, a central bank is cool, and especially if the central bank is owned by the United States. And that sounds kind of crazy, isn't it? But in fact, in, in, uh, in Haiti, the, the, the uh, uh, basically Citibank, the, before, the precursor to Citibank, owned the Haitian National Bank. All right? Wall Street owned Haiti, essentially. So they would uh, tell them to have central banks. Um, they would, uh, these money doctors would encourage them to develop new taxes and tariffs. No social services. You can't spend any revenues on like people's needs. And private work... Uh, I'm sorry, private funding for works projects to be done by U.S. firms. So if a country needs to develop, if they need to build a hydroelectric plant or a dam or an airstrip, then who would build that? Would they have a state company build it? No, of course not. You would lease it out to private contracts and which firms would, would get those contracts according to the money doctors? Um, American companies, GE, uh, later on, you know, Brown and Root, later on, you know, companies like that, right? So... Um, this, is, this will lead to some extent to Latin American development, but it also creates huge American uh, anti-U.S. backlash. And even those people who benefit from America's presence there, and, and if you've ever um, taken a class from Tom O'Brien here, uh, you've, you've heard this, and he's very good. He's written two really good books on this uh, revolutionary mission in the U.S. The century of U.S. capitalism in Latin America. But what's interesting is even a lot of the people who benefited from this American involvement there, the elites, the middle class, say thank you, you know, for economic development. Now get out, get out and let us run our own society. And so there's this real backlash against the United States, especially when the depression hits in the 20s and 30s. And Latin America, of course, is crushed by depression. Okay? Um, a lot of Latins, including the Latin elite, began to call the United States the New Rome. They're just like the Roman Empire. Okay? So uh, 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 by... Um, you know, by, by the late 20s then, this kind of legacy of interventionism, this legacy of sending the Marines in, really was beginning to kind of create a, a, a backlash as more and more people wanted the U.S. out, as more and more people said, we've had enough of you. And even in the United States, a lot of people said, you know, we can't continue to operate this way. This isn't good for, for anybody. All right? All right? So... Uh, uh, it's going to take a while for this to shift. Prior to the good neighbor policy, the United States maintained a, a policy of supplying terror and subverting popular movements. And I just want to kind of go through and talk about some of the examples of this. I won't be able to finish all this. The first is in the Dominican Republic. Um, there was a, uh, the U.S. Uh, goes into the Dominican Republic and occupies it with Marines in 1916. And this leads, and you know, this is not something that we talk about in great deal, with, to a, a guerrilla war, a guerrilla uprising. The United States goes into the Dominican Republic and essentially sets up a government with American advisors and American Marines and American money doctors there. However, uh, in the eastern provinces of the Dominican Republic, there develops a very, a very uh, 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 rugged insurrection, especially in a region called San Pedro de Macariz. And if any of you are baseball fans, you know about San Pedro de Macariz, half the like, shortstops in the major leagues are from there. So uh, um, there was this very strong guerrilla movement in, the, in that region. And so from 1917 to 21, the U.S., was actually in the Dominican Republic <clears throat> fighting against this group of Dominicans who wanted the U.S. out, all right? And um, 
And uh, this group, they were called the Gavalleros, were very popular among the people because they were fighting for national sovereignty and national honor, and everybody wanted the Americans and the money doctors out. Um, the United States is actually fighting there. The U.S. actually captures the leader of this group, who was very popular. Um, and uh, uh, um, finally, the U.S. subdues this insurgency. How? What does it use? It uses air power. Okay. The U.S. Uh, uh, um, um, in order to subdue this uprising by these, these uh, uh, Dominicans in San Pedro de Macariz and other parts of Eastern Dominican Republic, actually send in uh, 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 these, these, they're not jets yet, we don't have jet power yet, but they send in the most advanced aircraft. They were called Curtis JN-4B Jennies. And um, they deployed to San Pedro de Macariz and actually started strafing and bombing people all over. Guerrillas, villagers, everybody, right? So this is, this is one of the first recorded instances. This is in 1919, right at the end of uh, 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 World War I. Uh, but they, uh, uh, you know, bombing tactics against these, these, uh, these forces there. Um, actually, what I've got, the, the uh, account of it I have is actually from the, the Marine Corps' official webpage on it, the official study on it. So this isn't something they're like ashamed of. This is like part of their, their legacy, right? Yeah, we bombed these, uh, these rebels in, uh, in uh, uh, the Dominican Republic. So this is how the, now, you know, I guess if I wanted to be a smart ass, I could say, okay, you know, it's terror, it's clearly terrorism to take an airplane and, and, and run it into a building, but what's this, you know? When you use these aircraft against, you know, these people in this, you know, incredibly, you know, impoverished rural area, you know, who are trying to get rid of you. So, you know, trying to oust you. So, so this is how the U.S. finally subdues the Dominican uh, rebellion. And, and this is at a cost of a lot of, a lot of uh, lives, of course. The United States also reorganized the National Guard of the Dominican Republic and handpicked its chief of staff, a man named Rafael Trujillo. Is that on there anywhere? Oh, I was trying to be funny. Okay. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, put Rafael Trujillo in charge. Rafael Trujillo uh, was the American uh, chief of staff, the chief of staff of the National Guard, handpicked by the U.S. He became president in 1930 in a very violent and fraudulent election. He won the election 224,000 to 1900. Okay, 224,000 to 1900. Even Jeb Bush couldn't pull that off, right? Uh, Trujillo got tons of arms from the United States. American businessmen who controlled the Dominican sugar industry supported him. And FDR, and there is some debate as to who FDR was referring to when he said this, but it may have been Trujillo. FDR once said, yeah, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Trujillo was a brutal and bloody dictator who really kind of caused you know, mayhem and disturbance throughout uh, uh, that country for about 30 years. He was finally overthrown in 90, or 60 or 61, I believe. But uh, Trujillo was, was really a, a product of the United States, and the U.S. kept him in power. Uh, uh, there was a bloody repression throughout that period against unionists, against socialists, against human rights activists, basically against anybody who challenged the regime. So the U.S. continued to support this terror this terrorist government and to subvert the people's will, and it had ever since the teens. All right, um, this is something that's going to continue, which we'll pick up with next week in, in other areas as well.